Let's go to play again. Where's my th opening slide? There we go. You may be seated. That, that song takes me back to, to, the, to my teenage years. I've been in a, in a little church out in Blinn. This is called the Little Brown Church of Blinn. And the church was brown, and that was a very original name, I suppose. But the pastor there, he played an accordion, and he would just, he loved that song, and he would play it with so much gusto, usually off-key, but that's okay because I sing off-key too, so we'd have a fun time singing that song, Love Lifted Me. All right, so this is the third weekend of the month. There was a question, was a question in the box that's been removed. If you want to add more questions to the box, go for it. But the question uh, is about the love of God, God's love. And so today we're going to talk about the love of God. And, and I'm not going to be able to exhaust the love of God and, 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 and talk about every facet or part of it, but I am going to try to give you a good overview because to answer this question well, we need to think of the, the whole love of God, not just one uh, facet of it. So the question is, does God love the elect more than the unelect, or does he love them the same? And so uh, if you want to understand more about the love of God, I encourage you to read The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God by D.A. Carson. I'm indebted to his work on this topic and thus for this sermon. And it's not a very long book. It's about probably 150 pages-ish, so it's not terrible. Uh, you might have to learn some new theological words, but that's just part of those kinds of things. So if I'm to answer this question, we'll need to understand two things. First, we'll need to define the elect, okay, and the unelect. By the word, unelect is not a word, but that's what was in the question, so we're using it, okay? Second, we'll need to have a working knowledge of the love of God in its all its facets, okay? Sometimes when we start to look at a problem and we start to talk about something, we talk about God's love uh, or even an attribute of God, we tend to silo it, meaning we only look at that and we forget about the other attributes of God. So I just want to make sure you understand that God's love is not void of God's holiness, okay? And God's love is not void of his, of his wrath, okay? These are things all part of God, right? And, and they are all equal, okay? One does not supersede the other. And, and sometimes in our mind, we may put one as a higher thing than another thing, okay? Scripture defines the elect in three ways. So we're going to define the elect. We're going to talk about this because I think there's an assumption here. And we're going to see that Scripture actually talks about the elect in three ways, Scripture defines the elect as the entire nation of Israel. You can see that in Exodus 6, 7 and Ezekiel 25. Exodus, um, and you, I would, this is broke. Okay, um, just a second, because it's supposed to have these, at least one of these references in there each time so I can read it. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why the slide didn't populate. Um, God says, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens 
of the Egyptians. And then that reference in Ezekiel, God says, I chose you. Oh, you could also translate that as I elected you. Scripture defines the elect as the remnant of Israel in Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? It's talking about Israel. By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he, what? For new, do you not know what scripture says, Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen, elected by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer by the works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. And then scripture defines the elect as the whole as the church as a whole and as individuals that make up the church. And a good passage for that would be uh, Ephesians 3, uh, 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with ever spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and has chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world that we should be wholly blameless before him in love, he bedestined us for adoptions to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. So now that we understand Scripture's view of the elect, Israel, the remnant of Israel, and the church, we can easily define the unelect as those whom the Trinity has not chosen to receive salvation and be his children. The question given is not whether God loves or not loves. The question given is whether God, but to the degree he loves. The degree, does he love them more or does he love them less? Does God, does God love everyone the same or does he love the elect more? To answer this, we have to have a working knowledge of the love of God in all of its facets. And there are five major facets of lo the love of God that I'm going to talk about tonight. And, and it's going to go fast because I have a lot of stuff to cover, but it's five facets, and we want to have, try to keep these different facets in our heads as we're thinking through the love of God. Because no facet is independent of another, neither is God's love independent of his other attributes, such as holiness, or his sovereignty, or his power, or his righteousness. It, it, not, it's, they're all interdependent on each other. All inform each other in perfection, for he is God. And sometimes we can just blow up our brains because he's God, and we're trying to think and understand God. And God is awesome. And, and in one way, he's totally other and in some ways unknowable. But by his grace, he has revealed himself to us. And by the power of the Spirit, he has given us the mind of Christ. And so by the work of the Spirit in our lives, we can have an understanding, a glimpse at God. Wow. So D.A. Carson writes, the theme of love of God is not soon exhausted, either in our experience or in our theology. Doubtless it will occupy our reflection and call forth our adoration in eternity. The first facet to consider is God's intra-trinitarian tri, uh, Trinitarian love. That was a big word for you. I told you if you read that book, you're going to get some tips. That's the love within the Trinity. The love shared by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past. You, you know, it's interesting. This love is unique to Christianity. 
Okay? God the Father is one God, three persons. Right? And in that, God is sufficient. God did not need to create anything to love. Right? Because he already loved the Son. And the Son and the Holy Spirit, they all loved each other within the Godhead. Allah, on the other hand, is one. Allah, then, is lacking, because how does Allah love? You love yourself, that's pretty broke, right? Allah does not have within his deity anything to love, so he's lacking. He has to create objects to love. That's a side note. Sorry. Sorry. This shared love is the source of all love. And the model which John is drawing in in John chapter 4, and actually the whole book of First John chapter 4. We also see this love expressed through Jesus in action with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. The way they interact is showing the loving relationship that they have. John 4, 7 says, Beloved, talking to us, let us love one another. For love is where? From God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. One of the things God is, is love. It's not the only thing he is, remember? Right? We have tensions. We have other attributes that God is righteous. God is holy. Right? God is just. Right? Those are other things God is. God is all powerful. God then is the one who defines love. I'm going to repeat that because I think that's important. God is the one who defines love. Love and, and, and really what we often do is we input all ideas and our cultural's ideas of what love is. Okay? And, and not that those are necessarily bad. They, they can't be necessarily helpful. Um, but they're not the same definition of love of what God would give love. Okay? When, when the boy is standing on the beach and he looks into the girl's lie, eyes and he's lost and he says, I love you. Right? He's, well, thinking several different things, right? Right? Possibly, right? You know, she's, she's probably beautiful to him, right? He thinks that she has gorgeous hair, right? Uh, eyes that he can get lost in, right? See what I mean? When God looks at you, now, you might say, well, he sees Jesus, and in a sense, yes, that's true. But when God looks at you, he sees a sinner. Okay? But God still chooses to love you. God's love is given to us and not merited, okay? We don't deserve it. Okay, so we have a Best definition for us to model in Matthew chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 13 when it comes to love. And that models that are given to us are a selfless love. They're a love that goes out of ourselves and sacrifices ourselves in many ways. And so we want to make sure that we are applying God's definition of love when we're answering the question, how much does God love? You see, the model that kind of God gives us, it says, but I say to you, in contrast to love your neighbor, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's pretty hefty to, to chew on. God's intrapersonal love, giving and sacrificing for each other within the Trinity for all eternity. The second facet is to consider is God's providential love, okay? 
his providence, God walking in the world. This love is expressed in verses like Matthew 5.45. It's actually the next verse in the, in the Bible. It says, um, for he makes the, his son, the, the fire in the sky, rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God love that he holds this planet together and he continues to sustain creation and bring provision to individuals in the world regardless of person or creed speaks to his providential love for all his creation. That's an expression of love. All his creation deserves to be annihilated. That's an expression of his justice, right? But God, in his love and in his perfection, says, no, I'm not going to choose to annihilate them, even though that's what they deserve. I'm going to choose to redeem them. I'm not only going to choose to redeem the people, I'm going to choose to redeem or, or reconcile the planet itself. Read Romans chapter 8. The third facet to consider is God's desired or yearning love. And it's expressed in him wanting the world of ju- the, warning the world of judgment and his invitation and command to repent and believe in Jesus. We see this clearly in passages like John 3:16 through 18, or 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. 2 Timothy 3, 9. I don't have time to read all of those. I would encourage you to do so. But the one that it lays it out pretty clear is this call. For God so loved the world. John's use of the world is to talk about the system of the world, the, the people of the world. It's not talking about the elect. It's talking about the unelect, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, now this would be talking about elect, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved, redeemed through him. So whoever believes in him, Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. God gives the expression of love in his Son. The Son expresses his love by giving himself. So this would be part of the unelect, of the question. We see clearly that God loves sinners. He loves the world. This is where we have to be careful to bring our cultural definition of love into the mix. It doesn't mean he accepts the world like they are and says, yeah, go for it, whatever you want to do. And that's sometimes our cultural definition of love, isn't it? We, we might have somebody who we disagree with and we don't agree with what they're doing and we tell them that and they say, don't you love me? Yeah, I love you. That's why I told you that. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't take the emotional energy and the time to tell you that I don't think you should be doing that. And that that's not good. That's not healthy. That's not wholesome for you. Another way we do that is quite common with the phrase, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. And, and I know what we're trying to get at in that is that God has, gives value to that person as an individual, as, as created in the image of God, but he doesn't like sin. Okay, and I know that's what we're trying to get at, but it really, it, God in the scriptures does not, by, uh, to not divide the sinner from the sin. <laughs> the only way that the sin gets divided from the sinner is the cross. The spiritual circumcision of Christ cuts away the sin. And and through the cross, you die to that sin nature. You die to that natural man, and now you're separated. Okay? But God here loves the sinner. He loves the sinner. We don't have to bifurcate. I want to say separate, but a different word, but it's not coming out right. 
And this is done because the human experience tends to say that love and hate are mutually exclusive. We tend to think that. But I have a dog. I love my dog. Though sometimes I absolutely hate my dog. I still love him, but I hate him sometimes. Right? He does things like poop in my basement. Right? I hate that. Right? You see, but I love my dog. So I can have both hate and love for my dog. Okay? So even though we think it's mutually exclusive, even in our own economy, it's not. And it's not so in God's economy. He does not separate sinner from sin except through the cross. Okay? So it's not separated, and he chooses to both love and hate the sinner. The wrath of God abides on the sinner, on those who do believe. And if you want to read about God hating sin, you can just read Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, for an example of that. And, and there's plenty of others. Dear Carson writes, God's wrath is not implacable, not an implacable blind rage. However emotional it may be, it is an entire, entirely reasonable and willed response to the offenses against his holiness. But his love wells up amidst his perfections and is not generated by the loveliness of the loved. Okay? God's love is not generated by me or you or the acts that we do. It's generated by his very nature of who he is. Same way that, that the wrath is generated by <clears throat> uh, the nature of his holiness. Thus, there is nothing intrinsically impossible about wrath and love being directed toward the same individual or people at the same time. God in his perfections must be wrathful against his rebel image bearers, for they have offended him. God in his perfections must be loving toward his rebel image bearers, for he is that kind of God. So God both loves the world and hates the world and will bring wrath on the world, right? Judgment. The fourth facet to consider is God's conditional love towards his covenant people. What? Pastor said conditional love. Uh, God's love is unconditional. Well, yes, God's love is unconditional in different facets. God's love of the world is unconditional. There's no doubt about that, right? God's love for the elect is unconditional. We're going to get to that. But God's love for growing us is conditional. The best expression uh, is through Hebrews 12, 3 through 11. It speaks of the discipline of the Lord upon whom he loves. And then the book of 1 John is loaded with the concept of keeping in the love of God. And Jude 21 says it quite clearly, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. A conditional aspect of how we choose to continue to walk and respond to God's love. The fifth facet to consider is God's love for the elect. Those he has chosen to bring into the fullness of his glory. Now, we already covered those passages in the beginning of the sermon, that Exodus 6, 7, the Ezekiel 25, the John 15, 16 through 19, the Romans 8, 29 through 30, the Romans chapter 11, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, and Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. I'm not going to go over those. So we know that the chosen falls in those three categories. 
I think the idea of does God love the elect more is a result of God's election making me think of Titus 3, 3 through 7. You see, when God elects somebody, th- th- there is an action more than just sending his son. There is an action of making his son's death effective. And, and, and I think that's where that idea of maybe he loves them more comes from. Titus 3, 3 through 7 says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hating, hated by others and hating one another. Not a pretty picture, is it? Meaning, we weren't any different than the world. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we may become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It would seem, from a human perspective, that he loves the elect more since he chooses them for a relationship with him. Yet, I would caution us in reading the human experience of love into the love of God. We can definitely say with confidence that he loves the elect differently than the unrepentant, right? The, the, the elect, the love of God, brings the saving grace of Christ into fruition, into eternity. Paul, in Romans 9, 13 through 16, wrestles with this question of election. Uh, And I think we wrestle with this as well. And and we're going to be walking through the sections of Romans 8 through uh, chapter chapter 8 through 11 on Wednesday night to wrap up the section, uh, the series on God's will. So if you want to come hear more about that, that's what we'll be going through. Um, But In Romans 9, 13, it says, As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Remember, Jacob and Esau are brothers, all from the loins of Isaac. Too much salt today. What then shall we say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. So maybe our first thing is like, that's not fair. They were in the womb. G- uh, Jacob and Esau, they had never even done anything except maybe punch each other in the womb. Uh, that's not fair. That's not just. Paul says, no, that's the wrong perspective. That's the human perspective. For God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So here we're talking about the sovereignty of God in his choice of how he loves his creation. God is the one who chooses how he will express his love. It is more or less, is it more or less for certain individuals? It would appear so from a human perspective. I think what is more important, though, to remember is that God has chosen to love everyone. But that expression of love is different. Depending on what facet of love you're functioning in, what facet of love that love is being expressed? Is it 
Is it the living out? Oh, is it the, the expression of the inner Trinitarian love? The love that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit uh, shares and has invited us and has invited us, the church, the, the people of God, to, to come into and share with that, right? Is it, is, it, is it that? Is that what we're talking about? Oh, are we talking about uh, the love of God expressed in sending his only son, unique son, into the world to die, to redeem the world? Uh, and not only to die, hum- redeem humanity, but to redeem uh, creation, um, and, 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 right? So each love has different expression, depending on what facet of love you're functioning in, and also remembering that the facets, they're interdependent on all of who God is. So we can't just get siloed into one facet or another. Certain uh, doctrines can have a tendency to silo themselves in one of those areas or another. And when you silo yourself, you, you, you become blind to the other things going on. So I just encourage you to try to think through all the facets and not allow one facet to give priority over the other facet. Okay? So I would like to end with this passage, Romans 5, 3 through 9. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. I think it's important right now to recognize many of us struggle with God's love because we suffer. And we think from our perspective that if God loved us, we would not suffer. If God loved me, I would not have this issue. If God loved me, I would not be going through this. Okay? That's a human perspective being placed on God. As we suffer, it produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's, what? God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love, uh, the love of within the Trinity that was shared in eternity past has come to us through the embodiment, or not through, through the indwelling, sorry, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who lives in the believer. And that indwelling happens when you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You're saved and the Spirit comes to dwell in you. Pouring out the intro love of the Trinity into your heart. For while we were still weak, <clears throat> at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's a love. One would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still What? Sinners. Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him, by Jesus, from the wrath of God. God loves everyone. It's difficult to measure the degrees of love and the different facets of his love. The real question is, will you respond to his expressed love in Jesus?
Maybe, maybe you're at a place in your life where you've said yes to Jesus, but you've forgotten about walking with Jesus. You, you've been focused more on just the duties and the rules of Christianity and, 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 and doing things out of obligation and because you should. And I just want to encourage you to just say, wait, God loves me. And God gave his son for me. And God is working in me the will to do his good pleasure. When's the last time I thought about God's love and responded in love? And I know maybe your mind saying, well, God, Jesus did say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that is true. But the motivation for doing is love. Not guilt, not shame, not duty, but love. In Revelations, he would say, Remember your first love. Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you. We thank you for your love. Your love poured out in our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Your love for the world. Your love within the Trinity that we get to partake through the Spirit and by and dwelling us. Your providential love, your your love in drying the crops for the farmers, for the ones who don't know you and the ones who know you. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are a loving God. And we thank you that you are a perfect God and, and you have a perfect plan. And we praise you for that. We pray that you would help us to live and walk in response to your love poured out to us day by day, moment by moment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.